Seem to be starting two minutes late. Don't worry, I will I'll go two minutes over. You're like, you've been writing on the board for five minutes. What are you talking about? All right, so anyway, um, <clears throat> let me begin with some, some scripture here, joking aside. So today I'm reading Psalm 23. Here's how it goes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restore, restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, one of my favorite psalms, anyway. Uh, let me begin with a word of prayer. So, Dear Father, we uh, again thank you for this opportunity we have just to meet and to uh, study your creation. Just pray that you be glorified what we do and that we'd all understand Newton's laws together today, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, before I get into this, any questions about anything in particular we have been talking about? So, I will mention this. The only thing that kind of sticks out to me, I was looking over chapter two again in my notes. The one thing I didn't hit on in class yet, um, and we may circle back to it in like the review day or something, is if, um, you're talking about motion, kinematics, projectile motion, right? And the beginning and the ending height aren't the same. Then the angle for a given speed, which will maximize the range, doesn't have to be 45 degrees. And figuring out which angle actually maximizes the range for unequal beginning and ending heights is tough. Like it's not an easy math problem. And um, pretty much you have to use numerical methods to figure it out. Um, so that's what you'll see in my notes. Like I have one where it works out to 70 degrees, all right? Um, when, you, when, you, when you look at the maximum condition, like, you know, the, the, the derivative of the range with respect to theta being set equal to zero, which should give us the critical angle, right? Um, that equation that results is like not something you can just solve by hand. So you pretty much have to resort to some sort of numerical method to find the approximate angle which maximizes even for no friction projectile motion, it's a tough question. Yep. When you say numerical method, do you mean something like a software? Yeah, like a graphing calculator to look at the graph of the thing you're trying to see where it's zero, something like that, et cetera. Okay, so let me um, tell you guys a little bit about history, just for a minute or two. Um, so Newton's laws, where'd they come from, you know? Why are there Newton's laws? Who, where, where, does, where does the story start? So the oldest kind of physics that you can talk about would be geometry, right? Um, ancient civilizations, pretty much since, ever since we've been building things and surveying land, we've had some concept of geometry, right? Um, the Babylonians, you know, had studies of right triangle trigonometry. Pretty much as long as there's been civilization, there's been that kind of mathematics. So there's, there's been geometry from very early human civilization. Now, after that, um, of course, you have uh, the Greek school, um, the philosophers such as like Aristotle. The term physics is, is attributed to Aristotle. And so that's about like 384 to 322 BC is when he lived. And he had, this is where the, um, you guys ever heard like the uh, fire, water, air, earth business, that kind of physics, like that's Aristotle's physics. Things should go to their home, like fire goes up because it's supposed to go up, right? Because that's, that's its nature, it goes up, right? Um, you know, why does, if I was to drop, let's see here, you know, this worthless non-eraser, why does it go down? Because it's, its home is, is down there, that's where it belongs, right? It's like that kind of explanation. It's not mathematical, it's just made up nonsense, heuristic stuff. Um, but that was the state of physics for quite a while, you know? Um, now, um, there, there are a lot of ancient Greeks who did a lot of different things. Um, Ptolemy uh, is about 100 to 170, um, year of our Lord. He made charts and predictions that explained everything in terms of a um, Earth-centered cosmology. All right, so like the Earth's at the center and the planets rotate around the Earth and the Sun rotates around the Earth. Everything rotates around the Earth, right? Earth-centered. 
and um, told him he had charts and things that would predict where you'd find a planet. I mean, there's lots of math and predictions in what Ptolemy was doing, which made it kind of like, oh, it seems like something he's doing is right. He's making predictions, and they're mostly right, right? So you, you, know, you might, from a modern perspective, go, well, that's crazy to think the Earth is at the center of everything, but that's what they thought, and he did make predictions and things, right? So that stood up for quite a while. Copernicus is, you know, 1473 to 1543. Uh, he put forth a heliocentric model for the solar system, which said the sun is at the center, right? And um, so that was, a, you know, a big, a big change. And he was actually, it was, it was enough of a, a controversy that he was reluctant to publish it during his lifetime. Pretty much, he told friends about it, but it wasn't very public. And then kind of when he died, it came out that that's the theory. And, um, and of course, it has been verified since then. Um, Galileo Galilei, another important figure in 15, he was, you know, 1564 to 1642. He um, started experimentally testing things like is Aristotle's, you know, suggestion that heavy things fall faster actually true? And he did experiments and he found out, no, things actually fall at the same rate if you can kind of adjust for um, friction. Um, so that was an important event. Now Galileo also is um, very famous for his uh, uh, run-in with the Spanish, I guess, Spanish, I think Spanish Inquisition. Anyway, one of the Inquisitions. I, I'm not a historian, right? But uh, anyway, he, he got in a lot of trouble with the uh, Catholic Church because he, he wrote some rather kind of inflammatory stuff that they kind of told him what for. And, um, but he is also uh, really responsible in particular for promoting the mathematical nature of physics. He said, the following, he said, and you can find Galileo say this about 30 different ways. If you look up quotes by Galileo, you'll see that there's a multitude of these. It's something he said over and over and over again. The laws of nature are written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. So pretty much since Galileo, there has been you know, a push towards making physics mathematical. Uh, Kepler, who lived 1570 to 1630, um, found that... Now, Kepler wanted to show that the planets followed circles because circles had perfect symmetry. But annoyingly, when he looked at the data that was provided by this fellow named Tycho Brahe, Tycho Brahe was a meticulous astronomer who studied... who took careful measurements for like 30 years. Then he died um, in a way which is... Well, if we trust our... Uh, no, not guillotine. It's, it's much more exciting than that. He apparently liked to get in drinking contests, and he wouldn't leave the table so long that he, uh, if the story is true, it, uh, he, um, well, he succumbed to what happens if you don't leave to use the restroom long enough. He, like, burst his kidneys or something like this, apparently. That's the story. I, I, anyway, so Tycho Brahe was probably if you like that sort of thing, a pretty fun guy to be around. And, um, uh, but anyway, he did not live to actually see how his observations sorted out. And then Kepler got all of these observations that Brahe, Tycho had taken for decades and sat and looked at them and worked out that, in fact, the planets, uh, first of all, Copernicus is right there. The sun is in the center. Not quite, actually. Um, the Earth and the other planets, they form elliptical orbits around the sun, is what um, Kepler found. And he, he also found Kepler's laws, which explain the period of the orbits as they relate to certain features of the orbit. Now, so that was, you know, a, a vindication of Copernicus, of course, but also Kepler didn't explain why. Like, why are the planets going in these ellipses, right? There's no explanation. He just fit data. He did what's called, um, that would be what's called phenomenology. Uh, a, a uh, a phenomenological model in physics is when we find an equation, we just fit data to it. We don't explain why from more basic principles that's the case. That's what Kepler did. So then what? Well, about the same time as Kepler, let's see here, yep, um, there's a fellow named Simon Steven, or Steven, I don't know how to say that, and others, um, Nap Napier. There were, they were, this is not really physics, but they were finding ways to write numbers in much the modern notation. You have to understand, real numbers, like 
the notation we take for granted, like that very important 993 over there, like that notation for numbers is a relatively modern invention. In fact, the, the decimal notation, not that so much, but I, I, the whole numbers are a little bit older, I think, but this kind of thing, you know, um, not right up here. You know, we kind of take this for granted. I have 301.74, right? We just write that. You don't think twice about it, right? But that is actually a relatively modern notation. That kind of notation for numbers only predates Newton by about 50 years. And that's the kind of notation you need to make cal calculations with arbitrary precision easily. Before that, you had things like um, rational numbers and, and other much more clumsy number systems. I have a, um, a picture in the notes on page 52 that give you, you know, some of the earlier number systems and you can kind of get a sense of just how much better that is. Now the, the so all of this set the stage um, for Newton. Another important event was Descartes. Descartes was alive uh, 1596 to 1650 and we've been using Descartes all semester long. Descartes is the one who had the bright idea of taking a point in space and associated it, associating it with a pair of numbers, right? The Cartesian coordinate system. We take it for granted, but that is so much of what we're doing, right? So Descartes, the father of analytic geometry, the idea that we can use analysis, algebraic equations to study geometry. The, you know, the idea that y equals mx plus b describes a line. That's Descartes. All right, so um, all of this led, set the stage for Newton, who lived 1642 to 1727, to come up with what we now call Newtonian mechanics. So um, he was, you know, it was the right time and the right notation. Everything was just ripe for Newton to do what he did. And um, so it's, it's, you know, when you hear Newton saying, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, you've heard that quote perhaps. That's what he's talking about. All of these people through, you know, the Middle Ages to antiquity who made all of these different little steps that brought us to be able to write Newton's laws and understand them. Um, I mean, there are ancient, uh, you, you might call them mathematical physicists who've achieved some of the like sophistication of say Newton in the ancient times, but the only reason they could do it was that they're like way smarter than any of us. All right, like Archimedes is such a person. Archimedes invented a number system where he wrote a, an article to a king showing that um, it was a method to count the number of sands on the seashore. It's called the sand reckoner. I don't even know if we have a copy of it anymore, but he actually literally created a number system in order to make an argument that you could count the number of grains of sand on a seashore with his own number system. And he did other things like calculate the area of circles by exhaustion, you know, putting them inside um, polygons with more and more and more sides. But my point to you is that he's a genius. He did other stuff like he built some kind of like war machine that threw things the size of school buses from Syracuse into opposing forces. Why haven't we seen a movie made about that? Right? Did I miss it? Did they make that movie? Why on earth has this movie not been made? It's amazing, right? Archimedes. The writers. It's like Archimedes is a is a woman. No, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Too soon? No. Um, we'll gender swap him and something. I don't know. Are we allowed to say this at Liberty? I don't know. But um, <laughs> the better question is, are we allowed to say it on YouTube? Um, so anyway, I digress slightly. My point to you is just that Archimedes was a genius. We are not. And yet we can do more than he could because we have vector formalism and we have the benefit of Newton's laws, which give us a framework to calculate motion. So up to this point in the class, I have just told you such and so forth is here, such and so forth is there find the displacement, or here's the acceleration, integrate to find the velocity, or here's the velocity, differentiate to find the acceleration, right? I didn't explain where the velocity came from. I didn't explain where the acceleration came from. Now we finally start giving you a sense of where the, the cause of the motion is. At least that's what physicists try to sell you on. You can then ask the question, 
well, why is the force that, right? <laughs> so it's not, it's kind of a bait and switch a little bit, but anyway. Um, here's Newton's laws. So the first law is a body remains at rest or in motion at constant speed in a straight line unless acted upon by a force. All right. Second law. If F is the net force on a body with mass M, then the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the body. All right, that's Newton's second law. Newton's third law, which we won't use so much before the first test, right? We'll get back to this more after the first test, um, is that if two bodies exert, exert forces on one another, these forces have the same magnitude but are in opposite directions, all right? I guess I probably should just get it out here. Um, oh no, first things first. So there's been much debate as to the logical independence of these axioms, all right? Um, so, for instance, check this out. If the net force is equal to zero, right, on a mass, what does that tell us? According, if we accept the second law, what do you get? Either it's mass or it's acceleration or zero. Okay, Are you math major? No. Okay. Sounds like something a math major would say. Anyway, um, but we don't let mass be zero, right? So, what what has mass <laughs> five grams? What what has what has mass zero? Nothing. Air air has mass. What's that? Space. The vacuum has no mass. Hmm. Well, yes. So does space itself have mass? That's an interesting question, right? In some sense, no. In some sense, yes. From a relativistic perspective, we have E equals mt squared, right? Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Not, that's not part of this story, but it's a story we've heard. And so there's something called the cosmic background radiation, the CMB. It's everywhere pretty much in space. So there is that energy density that's everywhere. In that sense, space has mass. But is that part of space itself or is that some sort of something that's on top of space itself? Do you see, these are questions you could debate. Are you for or is it just... Well, first you have to get a PhD in physics. Then you have to have a successful career over the space of decades. You become useless. You become emeritus. Then you can care about this question. And get, uh, get paid for it. Uh, Potentially, I don't know, if you have sufficiently many fanboys to pay your, like, to make you be worthwhile to bring co to go to conferences, stuff like that, maybe I don't know. Subscribe to your Patreon. <laughs> Patreons. That's the future, actually. Okay, so let me get to the point here. Let's say that the mass is non-zero. This force is what? What, you're, what, you, what you told me three minutes ago, the acceleration must be zero, right? But the acceleration is what? It is equal to, by definition, that we've already made, the second time derivative of the position, right? By the way, thank you to Newton for inventing this calculus. Now, he didn't do it alone, right? Again, there were lots of people who did little bits of this before he got to it. And Leibniz also discovered this about the same time period, right? But why did Newton discover calculus? It was merely for the sake of, a, he, he really was interested in applying it to this, to mechanics, all right? Anyway, so this, we integrate twice, and what do you get? Well, integrate once, what do you get? You get dr dt is equal to what? A constant vector, right? Integrate again, what do you get? Again. We get R of T is C1 times T plus C2. There you go. What is that? <coughs> That's the position, right? That's, what, is it, what does it mean, though? So we learn in calculus that this is the parameterization of a line in three dimensions. What's the velocity of the line? It's right here, right? the velocity is equal to this constant vector, whatever that is. It's constant velocity in the direction of a line. 
So depending on the initial conditions, see if the initial conditions had that C1 vector was zero, then it would just stay at rest. R of t would be C2 forever and ever, amen. On the other hand, if um, C1 is non-zero, then we've got constant velocity motion along a line. What is this? <coughs> That's the first law. We just derived the first law from the second law using calculus, didn't we? So what's the necessity of the first law? What, why, why is there a first law? My advisor says that the real first law is that there exists a frame of reference. That's really what the first law is about, that there exists an inertial coordinate system that you can set up a position with respect to some origin and measure position as a function of time. That's assumed in these laws, that backdrop. So perhaps we should think of that as the first law, but it's debatable, all right? Anyway, so there's that. So next up, definition. A unit force, unit of force, Newton, in honor of you know who, um, big N, is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. This is the unit of force, the, the Newton. All right. Next definition I probably should make for you guys is that weight is equal to um, mass times gravity, right? So this is on Earth. So weight is a force, mass is not, right? So example one, suppose you have mass equal to, oh, I don't know, 100 kilograms. It's a relatively big dude, right? So, what's the weight? 100 kilograms times what? 9.8 meters per second squared. What you got? Looks like 980 kilogram meters per second squared, also known as Newtons. All right. So, the weight, you know, of a buff adult male or a fat one, um, 1,000 newtons, just to give you a gauge of how much a newton is. So how much, what would the weight of a, you know, so what, what is this in terms of pounds? We're more familiar with that. What's the, what's the conversion between kilograms and pounds? And is that fair? See, that's kind of a weird thing. A kilogram is a mass. A pound is a force. So you're, you know, the whole discussion of mass versus weight, it, it sets you up for a confusion as we usually talk about things because we freely go between talking about mass in the metric system, which is kilograms, and pounds, which is technically a weight in the British system. What's the mass unit in the British system? A stone? I think it's slug. It's slug. And that's as much as I'm going to say about it because we are going to stay in the system international. <laughs> No pounds. <laughs> no pounds in this physics class. My goodness. Uh, unless it just happens in Mastering Physics, but if that happens, what stays in Mastering Physics, what happens in Mastering Physics stays in Mastering Physics, let's say that, with regard to pounds. Um, okay. What are examples of forces? You guys tell me? So first of all, Force of gravity, right? Um, and so there you've got, you know, in terms of magnitude, mg. That's the, the weight on a mass m. Okay? Now, what's the actual story? What's the real gravity? Newton's universal law of gravitation actually says the following. It says that the force due to gravity <coughs> is equal to big G, m1, m2, divided by the distance between the center of mass for one and the center of mass for two, cube that thing, and then multiply that times R1 minus R2. Let me see if I can draw a picture here. Do, 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 do. Here's M1. Over here is M2. Set up my coordinate system. 
so you got here's your position vector to R1, here's your position vector to R2, all right? And uh, gravity is what? No, but I'm asking a more basic question. Finish, finish the a monster? No. Have you guys ever watched Fringe? Anybody ever, ever seen Fringe? There's this great episode of Fringe where these people, for whatever reason, end up having like gravity reversed. So if they don't wear special boot, <coughs> boots, they just fly up into the sky. Gravity becomes repulsive for them, right? But for the rest of us, you're not really worried if I let go of this that it's going to go like fly up and make a mark on the ceiling, right? You know what's going to happen. Gravity's attractive, right? Gravity's going to pull it down to the earth. Gravity is attractive. It is an attractive force. So that equation right there, R1 minus R2, which point does, which direction does that point? Where is R1 minus R2 in this picture? Does it go from 1 to 2 or does it go from 2 to 1? Them's your choices. What do you want? Two to one. Let me see if I agree with you. So you're saying it's like this. R1 minus R2. I sure hope you're right. If I did that right, the, this vector plus that vector should give me R1. That makes sense because the R2s, they'd be canceling. Great, you got it. So my question for you guys, since gravity is attractive, is that the formula for the force of gravity on M1 or for the force of gravity on M2? Yeah? No, you got to pick one. <laughs> the, it's attractive, right? So you said it's the force on which one? M1. No, it's got to be M2. See, because the force of gravity is attractive. So the force of gravity on M2 is attracting it to M1. So this is force of gravity on M2 due to M1. Yep. Uh, is the reason that you have it that it's the like, magnitude of the cube in the denominator and the difference of the vectors that are not the sides for the sake of the cube and the sides, right? Or it's for the sake of not using unit vectors here. So the magnitude is actually divided by the inverse square, but this is not a unit vector. So if I take the magnitude of this equation, I would have GMM divided by R squared, where R is the difference between the d distance between the masses. So that's Newton's famous inverse square law in terms of magnitude. But um, that's why I put a cube here in that. I don't think I answered your question, though. Um, I mean, this is Newton's universal law of gravitation. It simply says that you know, the law of gravity is that it is inversely proportional to the distance between the masses and it's attractive. And it acts on the line that connects the two masses center of mass. Yeah, it's just that because usually when I've seen that equation, it's just you know, R1 minus R, you know, X1 minus X2 squared in the bottom and, you know, something you have to do it. I was wondering what that distinction is. Well, I guess the thing that I'm missing here, and you should fuss at me here, is that I haven't written a vector. This is the vector form of Newton's universal law of gravitation. Maybe you're looking at the magnitude equation. And so that equation, your equation, just the magnitude of it. The magnitude of it, indeed, would be GMM over, say, you know, the distance between the masses squared. True. But yeah, that, that has to be the force of gravity of M2 on M1. What would the force of gravity on M1 do to M2 be? Same exact equation flip the R1 and R2. What happens then? You've got the same magnitude, but what? Opposite directions. So what is that an example of? That's an example of Newton's third law pair. So New Newton's universal law of gravitation is consistent with his third law. All right. All right. I don't think I really have anything testing you guys on the universal law of gravitation at this point in the course, but we'll come back to this eventually, all right? I'm throwing it out here because it's perhaps the most important example of a force that Newton came up with. There's other forces. What other forces can you talk about? There, there's forces which don't have a particular name. They're just like, you know, like I can put a force on this and throw it, right? I put a force on the eraser while I'm throwing it and it projectile motion, right? 
Um, I could like push on this. Uh, let's see here. I can fix somebody else. It's because I interrupted. Let's see here. Um, no, you're fine. You know, we we've got we've got pushing. We got pulling, like pushing and pushing and pulling forces of particular agents, right? Usually for me, Mr. Top Hat or Batman, probably. Um, let's see here. What else? You've got like. Um, you got spring force. The spring force, how's that go? Minus kx, usually. That's the force of a spring. Um, the way that works is you got the spring, do 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 do, and it, you, know, it, you have mass right here, and you've got x equals to zero. So the way that works is if the spring is compressed, that means x is negative, which means the force is minus and minus is positive, which means the force pushes that way. If the spring is compressed, it pushes the mass that way. On the other hand, if the spring is stretched, that means x is positive, and then this force is negative, so it pulls it back. So the spring pushes and pulls on the mass, right? If that's the case, that's an example of one-dimensional motion. What's Newton's law look like for a spring? For a spring acting on mass m, Newton's law is simply this, ma is equal to minus kx, where a is just what? d squared x dt squared, yeah? So, yeah. And that is a what? That's a differential equation. Okay, you learn how to solve that in Math 334, the solution is just this, x of t is equal to a cosine omega t plus some phase angle delta, where omega is the square root of k over m. a is the amplitude, that's the solution. Do you doubt me? Plug it in, see if it works, right? It's a differential equation. So how do you solve a differential equation? Some sort of magic you learn in Math 334. But for now, somebody tells you the formula and you see if it works. So plug it in, take two derivatives of x, what do you get? Differentiate cosine, you get sine. Differentiate sine, you get? You get, yeah, negative sine. And differentiate negative sine, you get negative cosine, <coughs> negative cosine, right? But each time we differentiate, there's a chain rule, right? Which brings out an omega, okay? So you get an omega squared, but omega squared is k over m. So I got this like minus k over m times m, right? So the m's, they be canceling, and that leaves you with minus k times this, which is exactly what you have on the other side. They works, yay. All right. But this equation also is nice, because if you think about a spring on a mass, it's oscillatory, right? It's just going to go back and forth and back and forth. But calculus and then the... This, this, this law right here, which is due to Hooke's, this is Hooke's law. Hooke was a contemporary of Newton that Newton really did not like, apparently. Newton's Principia is like a phone book. Hooke is nowhere mentioned in it, which is kind of impressive, because he was like a pretty major physicist in his time. For whatever reason, Newton didn't care for Hooke, um, story goes. And, um, but my point to you is that Newton's second law says ma equals to minus kx, then you do mathematics and you solved it and you've described the motion of a spring pulling on a mass, just like that. So that's one of the reasons you should take differential equations so that you can understand this more deeply, right? Although I can derive that in calculus too if you took my calc two. Now, um, moving on here. Example three, suppose you've got F is equal to zero minus mg, right? This is the usual story. If we take, you know, x to be horizontal and y to be vertical, that's what? That's the force of gravity on a mass m. What's the acceleration then? So if we say that this is equal to, you know, mass times acceleration, then what? Acceleration equals to one over m times zero minus mg. How's that work out? So we're right back where we started, right? Acceleration due to constant force of gravity 
is just 0 minus g, right? And then you know what to do to find the motion, right? That brings us back to the projectile motion, the kinematic equations, all that stuff. But my point to you now is that we can understand where it's coming from. It's just F equals ma, and the force is mg, pointed directly downward. That's where that's coming from. Now, truth, you're like, wait a minute, but you just told me Newton's universal law of gravitation is, is gmm over r2 minus r1 cubed times that, right? So how do you have this and that at the same time? Do you guys know the answer to that? Normal force is, no, I'm just going to have to say no. There's no R's. Nice try, though. What's that? No R's. There's no R's? I don't know. Well, like, I don't know the I mean, here's the picture. Earth, right? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's because there's no ratio. It's because the secondary, or the second mass is insignificant. Because the second mass is too insignificant. OK, so yeah, that's, I guess that's the question. So the Earth is, let's say the Earth is mass 1, right? And we're, at, we're M2, right? The marker is M2. So there's M2. And um, this picture is not the scale, but, you know. We can, we can put R1 at the origin for the sake of making the formulas nicer, right? Let's, let's put R1 equals, let's put the earth, let's put the center of the earth at the origin just to make life easier, right? So the force of gravity on M2 is center seeking, right? And what would the formula be? It would be minus G M1 M2 divided by this distance, which I'm going to write as like the radius of the Earth plus the altitude squared, right? And I'm going to drop the vector for a second and just use words. This force, let me get rid of the minus even. So this is directed what? I, my picture shows you, right? It's directed downward towards the center of the Earth, right? So here's the thing. In Calculus 2, you guys learn about power series, right? eventually. Some of you have already had it. Um, and so what you'll get is that that's M2G plus stuff. So the first term in the power series expansion for the, un the, the variable force of gravity is just Mg. So we're using an approximation when we write Mg. Near the surface of the Earth, the force of gravity is basically given by a constant force. However, if you go up in altitude, it would not be the case. The force of gravity gets weaker as you go further and further away, according to this inverse square law. All right, so we'll, we'll come back to that, these details later. My point to you is we're always working under an approximation near the surface of the Earth. The acceleration due to gravity is about g because we're assuming the force of gravity is constant. Even though it's not, it's actually dropping off. The force of gravity at the top of the marker's flight is actually slightly weaker than the force of gravity at the start of the marker's flight, truth be told. Right. But that difference is so indiscernible, like it's essentially irrelevant to near the surface of the Earth problem. So we just work under the nice simplifying assumption that the force of gravity is just the weight, mg. All right? Okay. I will not belabor this point. I'm just saying that's there conceptually always. Um, okay, so example four. Let's suppose you got a mass, right? And on the one hand, you've got 100 Newtons um, pulling this way. Let's say um, Batman goes that way, all right? And um, another rope is attached pulling eastward, and we'll say it's 500 Newtons Goku. Uh, Goku and Batman are pretty weak at the moment because we just discussed 100 Newtons is only like a tenth of the weight of a buff dude, right? And this is like the half of the weight of a buff dude. So these are pretty, pretty paltry forces, but we'll stick with it. And um, let's see, an evil cat. I know that's redundant, but evil cat pulls south with, let's say, um, 2,000 Newtons. <laughs> it's hopped up on drugs. That's what it is. All right. Don't do drugs, people. Don't do drugs. So the question then is, what's the acceleration of the mass? All right, now that question doesn't even make sense until I tell you a value of mass. So how, what do you want to, um, we'll make this a baby. <laughs> a baby, and its mass will be um, 
Two, uh, two, two kilograms. Now that's a small baby. We're gonna we're gonna go with we're gonna go with ten kilograms. We, we don't want to. I was a small child due to medical problems, but I was a baby. <laughs> ten, ten kilograms. So my question to you is, what's the what's the direction and magnitude of the acceleration? All right. So here we go. What's the net force? So we got ourselves a um, five hundred newtons from Mr. Goku there, and then zero one hundred newtons from the Batman. And then zero minus 2,000 from the evil cat. So the net force on the baby apparently is oh, 500, 500 newtons. It's my problem solving. This is probably my problem solving uh, sound effect. So it's allowed. Minus 1,900 newtons. There you go. That's the net force. So what's that equal to? That's equal to Newton's second law, uh, 10 kilograms times the acceleration. So what's my acceleration? My acceleration then is equal to 50 comma minus 190 meters per second squared. I'll, I'll pull the meters per second squared out like that. There you go, that's the acceleration if you've got Goku Batman and an evil cat pulling on a baby, as pictured. All right, so what's the, what's the direction then? Um, what's the magnitude? Sort of right and down. <laughs> right and down? Yeah, that, that's going to work as an answer. Let's see here. Um, 50 squared. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> You're just like, it's right. In, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. So, oh, come on. I muted this thing earlier. Sorry. Shush. Uh oh. Oh, good news. I got the, good news. My friend found my hole saw, so my basement will soon have light holes. All right. All right. So. I've been putting drywall up in my basement and I gotta cut the holes for the lights, you know? You guys ever done that? Sometimes. You ever seen the bowl they sell on Amazon for 20 bucks that goes over the drill and you put it up against the... Yeah? And I thought, why would anybody pay $20 for that? And then I drilled a hole over my head and I discovered why. I'm not buying the bowl because it's still $20, but... What's that? Just more planning. Or, yeah. Or holding it right. Did you, did you guys calculate this for me? What's the magnitude? Somebody have a number? 100, one, just 196 meters per second squared? Oh, 0.46. Let's make that 196.5 meters per second squared. And um, you, you told me uh, right and down, that's actually useful. I was just joking. Um, that's actually very important. So in other words, it looks something kind of sort of like this, right? And that's important because that tells us that we can use theta as inverse tangent because we're in quadrant four, where inverse tangent works. So minus 190 divided by 50 of inverse tangent. What, what's the angle here, standard angle? What we got? Nobody? 196.46. No, no, we're looking for angle. We can all pass force. Now I want inverse tangent of 190, minus 190 over 50. Or if you like, minus 19 over 5. Minus 75? Anything else? Just, just minus 75. 0.256. So we'll call it minus 75.26 degrees. So there you go. If you have multiple forces acting on the mass to find the acceleration, we, we add all the forces together, we find the net force, and the net force is equal to MA. That's, that's how we solve these kind of problems. All right. Um, all right. In the um, last couple minutes of class, let me just show you one of the examples from the notes because it's like super fun. You don't have to write this down. You can just look at it with me. I'm, pr I'm proud of this example. Yeah.
Yeah, so in terms of units, guys, the units for force are Newton, right? A kilogram meters per second. Now, when we're thinking about a vector, you have two choices, right? You can either, you can either write Newtons in each component separately, or since it's every, in every component, it's a scalar multiple, we could factor it out. So you could write Newtons to the side if you wanted. That would also be fine. That's what I did there. Like I, I wrote up meters per second squared. My, my point is you could write meters per second here, meters per second squared here, and meters per second squared there. That would also be correct. It's just easier to just write it once out here. It does need to be somewhere. Is there a case where you don't write it at all? There's a unit, the units are not a scalar, scalar multiple, but we can't? No, for, force to be reasonable, for a vector to be reasonable, all of the components of the vector must share the same units. Yeah. Otherwise, you couldn't add them together. See, because a vector is ultimately the vector sum of its different components, and we can only add things together, <coughs> apples to apples, oranges to or oranges, meters to meters, meters per seconds to meters per seconds, and so forth and so on. Listen, guys. So this example, I have given um, Ron Swanson um, rocket boots. I'm kind of proud. I'm, I'm very proud of this. This is my art, as you can see. I took, it took me at least tens of seconds to generate this picture. And um, so the idea here is I give him rocket boots. I let, them go, I let him go vertically for a few seconds. And then I let him thrust at like 45 degrees for a few seconds. And then I let him go. And then he just flies like projectile motion just under the force of gravity the rest of the way. So the way this problem is solved is in three stages. Stage one, the net force is the upward force of the rocket against gravity. Stage two, I've got the sideways force of the, of the rocket boots against gravity. And then stage three, no thrust, the boots are off, and he's just under the force of gravity. So there's always a net force, there's always an acceleration, but in each stage of this problem, there's a different acceleration. And so if you read this, what I do is I solve the kinematic problem in each stage separately using the kinematic formulas that we've talked about. Each stage has a constant acceleration, so I can find the displacement under each time period systematically and work it all out together. So, um, but anyway, if I have time, I'll circle back and work out the details in class, but probably won't happen because we don't have enough time to do all of the examples in class, as you probably know. Also, something I should mention. If you do not get anything out of coming to class and you're just like working in class on other stuff, you don't have to come here. Like, I do not require attendance.